Hi, my name is Gerhard Schwartner and welcome to Selling Power TV. Today, we have the great pleasure of meeting with Manny Mandina. He's a legend and the CEO of Outreach. Hi, Manny. Hi, Gerhard. Good to see you. You learned it in, in, a, in an East German school, right? The German government sponsors a number of uh, schools of Germany abroad called Humboldt Schule. It's a system on in every large city in Latin America. Right. Uh, so I went to the one in Ecuador. I'm, I'm from Ecuador, and I went to the Humboldt Schule of Guayaquil. The right. city there. And and your career began with uh, <clears throat> raising shrimp, and then you were raising unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> my my aunt had a shrimp farm, and you know my parents would ship me off to her house to you know be useful during the summer, and that's how I ended up you know mostly feeding and harvesting. Those those were the two hard jobs. I find your story really fascinating because um, you uh, had what I would call uh, a disappointing experience early in your life. Yeah. And once you know how to manage disappointment as a child, um, the disappointments as an adult in business are not going to face you anymore. You're absolutely right. And I think that that's actually my superpower is that whatever I'm going through is not as bad as the shit I've already gone through. But I think you have another superpower, which is um, you speak three languages and um, you're, you're able to process problems and challenges. Uh, from three different perspectives. You growing up in in in, um, in Austria and and it's very similar schooling in Germany. It's 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 very practical. You know, they really help you to go out in the world and like do something useful. Yeah, and, and that really instilled in me. Even grow even my even um you know raising my own kids in the U.S. system, I, I told them to, to 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 sort of like first think about how can you be useful to somebody else, and then think about what makes you happy. In that order. Because then you'll find true fulfillment. The, the German school that I had, the same professor, the same teacher that was teaching math would also teach physical education. You see what I mean? So you didn't have this constructs of like, oh, the math teacher is father so and the chemistry right. teacher is so and so. They will have two subjects. Yeah. And and because he was so kinetic and so strong and so, you know, yeah, I almost learned math forcefully. But I also learned to be very exact in playing sports, you know what I mean? Because he was the same guy. But I, I think it serves as an interesting model because uh, the American system uh, has more and more generalists, I mean, uh, specialists. But I think there's another thing that you have a, um, a background in engineering and uh, you also have a Harvard MBA. So you understand the world of technology, you understand the world of business. And um, all the successful people that uh, I've ever interviewed, they usually have two degrees. I think I got my MBA because I was not the brightest programmer. So I figure I have to do something else. Right. <laughs> it's incredibly uh, uh, useful. I was, I was surprised how incredibly important it is to express yourself correctly as, as an entrepreneur and then as a leader. Now that it's more of a leadership position, language becomes more important. People hang on to everything that you say. So you have to really be careful and right. precise. So let, let's talk about um, how you lead a diverse team. So first of all, uh, you embrace diversity because uh, you have a diversity background and, and you come from a very diverse culture. And uh, you, you understand communism and capitalism and uh, you know the, the generational differences. So what is your view on diversity and how does it help increase sales? I fundamentally believe that you have to, to some degree, resemble who you're selling to. And, and you have to, you know, figure out what their aspirations and motivations are and make sure that you that you embody and reflect those to them. As millennials are taking over the workforce, force, not in, in very large numbers, very, very quickly, they see themselves as a more diverse generation and the generation that is coming right after the, the, the zoomers see themselves even as a more embracing and more diverse and more inclusive so if we don't reflect those values back to our customers and potential buyers there's going to be a disconnect they're, they're going to feel that we're not the right partner for them for some other reason that had nothing to do with your product or your salesmanship but rather your value of life the second thing that i fundamentally believe is that we started our reach with so the two types of people. So my co-founders, all three of them are 10 years younger than me. They're all from the Pacific Northwest and they're all white. 
And the fact that they came in through other walks of life, that it were different than mine, and and I was older and came, you know, and, and an immigrant, made the whole stew significantly richer. Because all the other stuff in tech is true. You have to work long nights. You have to work every day. You have to work harder than the next person to be. And you have to be technically astute and hustle. Like all that thing doesn't go away. But if you set the, 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 the tone really early of the types of people who are going to go and deliver that for you, meaning a diverse group, then you can build a very big company with a diverse team that is also high performance. So let's shift to the challenge of performance, especially in a, a economy that becomes more uncertain, where we have inflation, we have, uh, uh, you know, a, a crazy world to deal with. Yeah. Um, what What is your advice to sales leaders on how to approach the new market? The first thing that every leader needs to do is to get a hold of their own mind and their own psyche in their own energy and make sure that they are in a in a calm and collective state to to be able to not only project calmness and, and, and collectiveness but also to inspire teams to to navigate through this their faces and their words will be amplified so they need to first of all make sure that they they can control what they can control and they and they remain calm through through the storm second of all everything has a silver lining even during COVID. Some people were buying, some people were going out, going out of business, some people were staying steady. The trick is to find who's buying. And then, and, and that will deliver your growth. The next trick was to find who you can help now so that they can be the engine of growth post this uh, recession or pandemic or whatever have you. And then the third was to show empathy and do as much as you can to help those that, that were really struggling. Because they will remember that you did that. It will be the third way to come back after everything comes back. You have to learn to communicate that fact to your sellers. And your sellers need to be able to communicate that fact to their own customers and their own prospects. Because those who radiate energy and inspiration and sort of a better a better future are the ones who are going to stick around to see the, the transaction go through. So tell me about your first sale. My first set of users were uh, reps in... Um, I forget whether it was it was Zenefits or App Dynamics, one of those two. Uh, I, I don't quite remember. Both transactions happening around the same. Time. And I would call every rep. I would call every manager. I will ask the rep after I made the sale, you know, uh, how you like in the product, and they can introduce me to their manager. And if they like the product, they will introduce me to their manager. If they introduce me to their manager, then they will let me navigate through it. And I was seeing other companies making a little mistake. And this is very common right now in product-led growth, which is the hot thing in the news. Of like, oh, you gotta let him try. You gotta let everyone try. We you, there was another competitor at the time, uh, Yesware, that was for free, so they can get it, and then you can sit down and, and try it, and 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 and, and use it for free. And I would get the pushback from the ref saying, "Hey, what can I just try it?" And and I made it very clear that I will let you by you putting down a credit card and, and using the product, you are trying it. You can cancel at any time, but at least I'm getting paid for the work. You right. Know what I mean. So it is a transaction. I'm going, I did a bunch of work for you. You're about to get value from it. If you don't, you can cancel, but at least I got paid for the work. And later on, uh, when I became friends with uh, the VP of Social Yesterday, I realized that that putting somebody on a free trial is not all, all wins because that person will always ask for more free, right. you know, for more free value for that person to make an intro upstairs. Whereas I never had that problem because the moment you showed up, you were paid. So I got the same PLG motion. It was a little more manual because it was me, me man, doing the, the, the selling. But I got to pay for every single use out of outreach. And then and then that propelled us to, to, to make sure that we retain those customers. So was there a time uh, in the early days where you thought this is never going to work? Your job as a leader, as a merchant of hope, is to inspire everyone that 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 if as long as you keep your head down and chop wood and carry water and make acquire a customer or acquire a rep and make that rep successful and then to do two more tomorrow and then five more tomorrow and then 10 more tomorrow that we're going to dig ourselves out of it. And that's how we kept all four of us, that voice is in our head quiet. That's going to fail. Because failure is always a, is a whisper away, you know, from 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 where you are. They, you know, Salesforce will come up with something or there's competitor X who just got funded. There's competitor Y who's much bigger than you. You know, nobody has ever succeeded. The startup has a 99% chance of, of failure. C Seattle back then was not a big sales town. So like, you know, who are you and, who, who, you know, why are you making this product? 
you know, no VC will touch us because we're a pivot. So there's all this noise that is negativity that you have yeah. around. As long as you concentrate on acquiring a customer and making the customer successful, then it dies. It makes a lot of sense. Instead of uh, focusing on the fear of failure inside your head, um, you externalize it and focus on the customer success. That's exactly right. And and so we got really good uh, at you know call calling people and 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 talking shop. You know, eventually we develop a rubric of all of the different pains yeah. a rep or a manager or an organization would have. And and you know we develop a hypothesis and we will call in with a hypothesis. You know, we will say, do you have enough pipeline to close this quarter? And if they say yes, or they say no, that's not my problem. My problem is next quarter. Boom, I got a problem for whom for which I got a solution. They immediately identify that we can talk about. And then the remaining 30 minutes of the conversation is talking shop. How do you generate pipeline? You know, how you know what are the activities do you think? Is that activity marketing? Make marketing. All of a sudden you're talking shop, and the end of the talking shop, and she said, Yeah, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me buy your product. So, what is your advice for sales leaders? Uh, everybody knows that the 80-20 rule, that 20% of the salespeople sell 80% of uh, the sales volume. Um, how can you increase it from 20 to 30 or from 20 to 40%? So the first thing you do is you, you have to drop your playbook and go ask your top sellers, what are they doing to drive that 80% of the number? And then use the next 10%, the hungry ones, right? The 20% that is driving 80% has a tail of 10% or 20% that want to be that 20%, but they're not. Use that as a training, as a, as a ground, as a testing ground to see if this is really scalable and then try it again. You think there are 12 or 13 million customers out there for outreach. How do you see outreach five years from now? The number that I chase is there's 30 million B2B reps in the world. There's 15 or so million accounts or 10 million accounts, give or take. But I really, I'm really inspired. What gets me out of every morning is to make sure that every single one of those 30 million reps are achieving their full potential. They are making more money. They're driving up, uh, you know, they're driving a bigger pipeline. They're closing deals more efficiently. They're going home earlier. But whatever that is that that, that they want to do, that they can do it on the back of sales. And the sales profession becomes, you know, this, you know, we can bring it back to being, you know, a vibrant place that is inclusive and everybody can make money. So that that's really what drives me. So in five years, you know, we put a huge density onto that number. Right now, we have two hundred thousand users in the platform right now, out of the thirty million. So we're less than, you know, we're less than 5% penetrated, you know, so right. we need to do a million even, you, you know what I mean, to, 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 to be, to make a significant dent in the world. And so the way that we get there is making sure that, first of all, is, you know, are the reps ready? So some of reps are not ready to embrace, you know, automation and AI and workflow. So we have to either, either um, educate them or, or just wait for the new generation that are digital natives to come in and sort of help them. And then sort of see if the rep is ready and the organization is ready, meaning is the organization, you know, really looking to move to the next year of growth, then are we ready to catch them and, and sort of bring them into the journey? I think what I like about most uh, in, in this conversation is that I get a sense that you are a purpose-driven leader that leads a purpose-driven company. And, uh, and the purpose is to help professionalize sales all over the world. That's exactly right. How can people learn more about Outreach? Go to your website. Go to my website, go to Outreach.io, read, go to my LinkedIn, go to my team's LinkedIn. They all have great content. They're putting out their thoughts. We're we're a fairly open company where we have an open policy where you can you can just build your own uh your own voice and your own profile. And a lot of people at Outreach do that. So you just go read our content, engage, learn.